Alexandria Park Tiny Home Village in Los Angeles is a development of 103 micro units that serve as temporary homeless shelters. They offer people and families a safe and dignified place to live before transitioning to permanent housing. The modular units are designed for a pallet shelter, though. a social purpose company. I mean, that, that, that's a good point. It's, I mean, it's definitely dignified, a step up from I mean, a tent. What is the definition of dignified at this, that point? That's true. Is that a, is the middle class definition of, of like would a middle class person feel dignified living in, in a box that size? I uh, I would imagine no, unless they're you know yeah putting a whole lot of I money mean, they, into it. They don't even want to share a bathroom with family members. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Let alone strangers. Yep. Good point. Company based in Seattle. They measure eight feet by eight feet and are composed of a simple steel frame and lightweight insulated panels of varying thicknesses. These components can be flat packed for easy storage and transportation. 30 shelters can fit on a single truck. The parts are durable, lightweight, portable, customizable and easy to assemble. They don't require a foundation because they have an inbuilt substructure. They can be assembled in under one hour with minimal tools since the parts lock together with nuts, bolts, and pins. The units can withstand winds of up to 110 miles per hour, snow loads of up to 25 pounds per square foot, and temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. These units can be connected to the city's power grid, a generator, or solar panels. The interiors are utilitarian but purposeful. They can sleep two people and hold their belongings under the bed and on a shelving unit. Each unit has a smoke detector, carbon monoxide monitor, egress door, and a fire extinguisher. These temporary shelters can be quickly deployed to a site in case of emergencies. Most people and families live in these units for three months before moving on to permanent housing. The units are easy to clean and maintain. They can be set up on any flat land, including leftover spaces next to highways. More importantly, they have 24-hour on-site security, shared bathrooms, dining areas, laundry services, counseling, housing placement, job training, and mental health services. I find it very impressive that Pallet Shelter, the company that designed these units, asked the homeless for their input during the design process. Moreover, all employees who built these shelters are formerly homeless, addicted, or incarcerated themselves and have found stability through meaningful employment. The flat pack nature of these units is very important because the more you can transport on a single journey, the lower your costs are going to be. One Pause. of the many hurdles of you. This is a little joke about circular economy. You know, we will we'll solve the unemployment crisis by um, employing people to solve the unemployment crisis. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah, we'll solve we'll solve homelessness by employing the homeless. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, this is. But there's 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 similar, but but that's a very cynical take. So mm. not don't take it, don't take it home with you. Okay. <laughs> Using shipping containers as emergency or temporary housing is their size and weight. These units remind me of the bare bones utilitarian emergency hospitals that popped up in China last year. Hope of the Valley, one of the organizations behind this project, regularly receives criticism about their efforts to help the homeless. To help the community fully support and understand these projects, they offered a tiny home sleepover experience back in April. You could stay at the site overnight, enjoy a dinner, live oh, music, a comedian, and breakfast. <laughs> One of their sleepovers was catered to business owners and community leaders, while the other sleepover was designed for couples and partners, what they called the ultimate date night. It's an interesting approach to community engagement. While I appreciate all the work that they do, there are some drawbacks in this project. The gaudy, childish colors are a questionable design decision. I'm sure the architects chose to do that. When a person is in such a tough, challenging situation in life, the last thing they want is for their shelter to stand out and attract attention. They want to fit in, but these colors do just the opposite. Humans also need a sense of ownership, a feeling that something is theirs. It might be beneficial for them to work on their housing unit, build it themselves, or engage in community projects, even if it's for a short period of time. 
Additionally, this project is lacking vertical you pause density, it? which in go for it. Uh, can you go back to what she was showing the what it looked like? Uh, the... it was literally... No, it was just a second ago. It was just a second just from when a you have it. Uh, forward. Or engage in community yeah. projects, even if it's for a short period of time. Additionally, okay. There. Okay. So, at first, I figured like I would respond with like her comment about the colors. It's like, well, using colors so that the there's um so you know which one's yours, you know. But obviously, looking at this picture, that's not the case. Like. It's like, which one is yours? Oh, it's the fourth one away from that red one. Yeah. I mean, if they were alternating colors, mm -hmm. at least you'd know, like, oh, it's the fourth one, It's but it's a white one. Sure. Um, but, yeah, solid colors are, you know, very gaudy. Yeah. Um, and, but also kind of suggesting that the needy need to build their own shed. Uh -huh. um, do we ask that of any potential homeowner? Like for them to make it feel like it's their home, I suppose over time they renovate the a building to their mm -hmm. liking, but they don't always do all the work themselves. Um, at least some of the work. I mean, Habitat for Humanity basically does this to some extent, but those are full permanent houses, not temporary emergency shelter, which is like what this is. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, this this stuff should only be used like after a hurricane. Yeah, uh, or, you know something, but not like for three months. Yeah, that's that seems like uh, a long time. Yeah, I don't like that. I, if it is like a week, but three months, yeah, yeah, I can see that too. Yeah, I don't understand the the monochromatic homes. Like, if you want them to take ownership, why not let them choose a color or out. or just you know. Take a few basic colors that you'd see in any neighborhood. Maybe not like the suburban, you know, taupe to beige color palette, but, you know. Well, it uh, kind of comes down to, like, what people coming through here, they're not really doing so by choice. Right. And what choice, like, this is just one waypoint in the system. Right. So it is kind of a lie to make it seem otherwise. But in interviewing you know, potential users or current users of the shelter system. I mean, good on them, right? It's, it's kind of basic decency. Um, but yeah. Yeah. We can keep going now. Okay. Also, there's just, I mean, there's a couple of windows, but it just seems very enclosed, like closed off. Well, you, well, you know, well, there's no, I, I was thinking about that while looking this as well. Uh -huh. The windows are small so that you get daylighting, uh -huh. but basically privacy. Yeah. If I, I suppose big, if the windows were any bigger, people outside would be able to look in. Yeah. The, I mean, it's just literally one room. So I guess there is no, there's no hiding. So yeah. Good point. This project is lacking vertical density, which in turn increases the cost per unit dramatically. If you are paying to run utilities to a particular site, like water, electricity, sewer, etc., the more units you can comfortably fit on the site, the more people you house, and the more cost-efficient your project is going to be. Hoboth Valley claims that, unlike traditional shelter or affordable housing projects, tiny homes take a fraction of the time to build and assemble and are just a fraction of the cost. The Alexandria Park Tiny Home Complex cost $8.6 million to build. At 103 units with two beds per unit, that's about $42,000 per bed. The cost to operate the campsite is $3,300 per person That's assuming each of them have month. two beds in them. Right. Yeah, but which like, they might not all. Yeah, they, they shouldn't. I mean, I can't imagine. Unless it's a cu actual couple or mother and kid. Right. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. They I hope they're not just throwing strangers together to, to bunk together. That would be bad. It's too small. I mean, it's a closet. Right. And that's kind of the, the true, like, couldn't they just add another $100 to the cost and make it, you know, add another five feet wider? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of thing? Yeah. Um, it's not, like, why do they have to be, like, like these little tiny houses? They're the size of, the, they're smaller than the bedrooms at the SRO I worked with. At. Mm -hmm. because at least that 
there was a bedroom and a closet. Right. Yeah. I mean, even my college dorm room was, was similar in size, but it too had a closet. Now, with space. now the SRO was a renovated warehouse building uh-huh. um, with full interior walls put in and all that mm-hmm. uh, with a courtyard. And so a lot of the windows go out to the courtyard, but then of course, if you know the guys are smoking, making noise in the courtyard, it, it would make it hard to sleep. Um, that's we try to enforce quiet hours and stuff. But some guys want to sleep in the morning, but mm-hmm. whatever. Different story. For sure. All right. Well, right, let's continue on. These tiny homes cost more than the monthly mortgage payment for a medium-sized LA home. What's going on? The units themselves are relatively cheap. LA is paying pallet shelter about 8,600 per unit. Land acquisition is only about 11% of the budget. Initial site work costs $1.5 million. Underground utilities cost $122,000. Concrete foundations cost $253,000. The office and staff rooms cost $312,000. Mechanical, electrical, and fire alarms cost $1.1 million. Permits, fees, designs, project management, and inspections cost $626,000. The rest goes to soft costs, including consultants and financing. There you go. The overspending on this project is not an isolated case. In Los Angeles, voters approved a $1.2 billion bond in 2016 for building housing for the homeless. Proposition Triple H was supposed to have moved 10,000 homeless people off the streets and into new housing. Delays and bloated budgets have reduced the 10,000 person goal down to 7,300 persons. According to Mayor Eric Garcetti's website, only 14 of the 111 total projects are in service. 804 out of 7,300 people have been housed. The average cost of homeless shelters in California is now $700 per square foot, as much as luxury housing. Something is terribly wrong. I'm not being heartless by critiquing the situation. We should help people that have fallen on hard times and assist them in taking care of themselves. But as tax-paying citizens, we have a right to be concerned about the misuse of tax dollars. These bloated projects are supported by local, state, and federal funding. If funds are being misused, we can't just dismiss public outrage and we can't be afraid to raise questions. Frustrated Californians believe that the local and state government must be held responsible for their failure to complete projects on time and within a reasonable budget. Props to Pallet Shelter for creating these sturdy, reliable okay, you can stop $1,600 the video. units that, and for it. all the community work. So, just, just I'll get this out and then you can have a floor. Sure. This kind of goes to how we can't really solve these problems under within capitalist policy. Mm-hmm. Like we can st- we can have all this public spending to build homeless housing or homeless like housing, mm-hmm. and because it's in capitalism, like you saw, like a third of the cost was in the financing and consultants and other capitalist bullshit. Yeah. Um, not to mention what raises, like, why would the foundations just alone cost a quarter million? Or why would smoke alarms and utility, like, a million and a half for that, a million for this, a million just for the cot, for the land. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it, was, if it was just the land, the utilities, and the tiny homes... It would be maybe three million dollars, but or two, instead of eight, eight and a half. It's it's all inflated from the construction industry. And I was kind of covering this in my urbanism episode that the regulations and all the rules that need to be followed, whether it's building codes, zoning codes, whatever, they're written maybe by nonprofits, but the nonprofits are funded and uh, pretty much owned by the construction real estate hmm. industries. They're writing the rules to make it expensive for you, the home buyer or or tenant, um, to exploit you, to hmm. make the cost as high as possible. 
um, because they know whether it's even if it's a homeless shelter, it's going to be with public money and then they can basically charge whatever they want. Um, and we, whether it's a taxpayer or individually, have to pay it mm -hmm. uh, because it's an inflexible demand. True. So what, what, what's your takeaway from uh, the information uh, um, supplied here? Oh, boy. I mean, definitely, it's, it's, it's certainly a step up from having people just uh, live in garbage and tents. And it's definitely going to be more secure. So in a certain sense, even though it's a it's, uh, super inflated price, I guess it's better than nothing. I just wonder how this could be done otherwise. Yeah, I mean, it... Like she said, it was the, it's the cost. It's the same cost of a middle class house, right? Or yeah, that just doesn't per month. Anyway. Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Why not just section eight? Give everyone their section eight, right? Um, there was there was another instance of this with one of the Catholic charities in Albany that per person they're given up to nine hundred dollars to pay rent. That means there are these slumlords, maybe the, you know, the few people that will accept the payment, like rent from a nonprofit, because otherwise they require you to have this kind of job, yeah, or this kind of regular income for for the for the lease. You know, you, you have right. to prove that you get a bit paid every month for the next year. Right. Something you can never really guarantee, but uh, it's depending on the job. But they'll charge nine hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You know per month because that's what they get from the agency mm -hmm. or uh, or section a guarantees this much of a payment so uh it's it's meant to be like up to nine hundred dollars right right but yeah but there, there's this one nonprofit guy who who actually like couched it that way where it's like oh we, we could get nine hundred dollars per unit if we fix up three units because uh we'll 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 rent them to refugees and they get nine hundred dollars a month housing costs i'm like that sounds really exploitative man yeah and that's kind of one of those moments where like i don't like work i don't want to work with you anymore right uh, especially since i thought the deal we had was we fix up this house and i get to live in it right, um, right. it's part of it i don't need all of it but fuck man um so he just kept going back on like things he was kind of saying to get me involved and invested okay so so if you were part of, say, a, a, an organization, not 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 an NGO necessarily or or a governmental organization, but if you just came together with a bunch of your neighbors, and yeah. you and you were deciding you wanted to help out building housing for homeless people, you the government local government was failing at that, and you wanted to build a, a parallel structure. What what would you do to to go about? What would you do? You know how how would you form something? Some sort of a, a co-op, like maybe a, a cooperative. Yeah, how's or a something? cooperative? If I'm still kind of figuring that out. There was one possibility in the form of like a real estate co-op, mm -hmm. and there was a, a based nonprofit in the San Fran area that was experimenting with like a new type of real estate cooperative, mm -hmm. which has certain advantages and disadvantages, but particularly it has advantages over like just a housing cooperative where it's a, you have a board and you're just kind of buying, you're just, it's usually best with one building, you know, building right. goes co-op. Right. But a real estate co-op means you're actually buying up land and buildings yeah. and managing them. Yeah. That's kind and of the, awesome. this one co-op, dare call it, dare call it a collective, more of a collective. Called margination. They they broke up because they were you know, kind of crusty anarchists with uh, interpersonal lives that were messy. So when there was like this family drama, they everything just came to a halt. But before then, they had uh, taken a bunch of tech bro millionaire money and rehab like five buildings, and they were renting them out like three hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. You know. A low market rate, because mm -hmm. um, they were based in in real, and and they didn't need that much rent money, 
um, to to manage the building. So they were basically doing it at cost because um, they could just keep fundraising from tech pro millionaires. But then when that was turned off, I think they were they were sunk, uh, and that's that was kind of the problem. You can take charity from you can convince tech bros that you know you you we're gonna take rich people money and do anti capitalism with it. But I kind of mentioned this to one of them in conversation, like. I think you can only do that once. <laughs> yeah. Because once they realize that you're not like playing by the normal rules and that you're a co-op that wants to make other co-ops and that right. this goes beyond ideologically just helping the poor out or to be entrepreneurial because you yourself are not actually like interested in perpetual growth or whatever. Um, but they had like five buildings which is a really good start. Yeah. But otherwise, what I see around me are these kind of, they're, they're kind of like, I dare call them pseudo nonprofits because basically you have an individual that's being an entrepreneur, like a, a regular landlord, but because they're, they're starting out from nothing or they're working class themselves, mm-hmm. uh, they're not going to get bank loans because they don't have a blue white collar job or something. Right. What they do instead is they start a nonprofit, get grants for rehabbing or whatever, mm-hmm. and and they build the and well they not just build the housing but they fix the housing with that. that. And because uh, that's well, that's what we have in Albany a lot of vacant housing stock that needs rehabbing that only public money can basically fill. Um, so we have that. And they okay. usually have names like Block at a Time or Building Blocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they're usually run by black women uh, my age. Hmm. So, yeah, there's a little bit of envy there when I'm looking at them, uh, what they're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's, it's very, very difficult. It seems like a big puzzle. But then I come across ideas that are like, okay, I want to try this. But I kind of want I need a team to try it with. Um, sure. But otherwise, we're all hustling alone, which is uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, and not based. sure. Yeah. And not based. <laughs> Definitely not based. You know. Yeah. Much, much more based to to do it collectively as a group. 